Hey guys, welcome back. In this first lesson, we're going to talk a bit about what Unity actually is, and then we're going to get started by installing the Unity Hub and the Unity Editor. So first of all, what is Unity? Now, there's a lot of stuff on the website you can check out, but just to give a brief overview, Unity is currently the leading engine on the market. It has the most market share of any engine, and that's simply due to its low barrier whenever you want to enter into the game development world unity is the quickest and the best way to get started doing that at this very moment now that's because it's capable of creating 2d games and 3d games that are AAA quality it's got a very very uh, powerful language that you can use uh, c sharp it's a microsoft language it's fantastic you can export to any platform you can think of from PC, mobile, consoles, and anything in between. And it's great for beginners and experts alike. So if you're just getting started, this is a great place to start. And if you are an industry veteran and just want to learn what Unity is all about, Unity is a fantastic tool that will help speed up your development process by quite a bit. And in the end, Unity is very capable of creating AAA quality titles. It's just up to whether or not you and your team are able to. So here we go. What is the Unity Hub? This is the first thing we're gonna to have to install to get started. It allows us, once we have the Hub installed and downloaded, it allows us to install the Unity Editor directly from there. Now we can install the Editor without the Hub, but the thing the Hub allows us to do is it allows us to manage multiple versions of the editor if we would like if we have a need for that maybe we have a project that requires an older version or we're making a tool that needs to work on older versions so we have to test on older versions of the editor and it's important that we do that and we have an easy way to do it and that's it's uh, what the hub is there for it allows us to manage different projects across different versions of the editor and it's simply just this little app you see here that allows us to have our projects here. We have a learning tab where we're going to be able to learn some stuff if we want to. It's not going to go in nearly the depth that we're going to go into for this uh, course and all the courses uh, connected to this course. But it's a good place to get some information and to get some packages that will jumpstart your development. Then you have the installation tab, which is going to show you all of your current installations and allow you to get new ones as they're released and also participate in the beta releases so let's get started by downloading Unity Hub. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to unity3d.com. And there's a lot of information on the, the homepage here that it'll teach you a bit about what Unity can do, what it's made for, and uh, just how powerful it really is. And there's a bunch of things you can check out under uh, Made with Unity games that were made uh, using Unity. And you'll find some inspiration there for sure, as there's some really killer titles made with unity you probably didn't even know a lot of the games you enjoy every day were built right in this very tool so for now though all we care about is this get unity button right here i want to click on that and that link's going to take me to the store page store.unity.com and here we have a few options now if you if it's the first time you're looking at it you may be turned off by the fact that you see prices here right? it's, it's it's a lot of money it looks like but the good thing is is that for beginners and honestly up to successful studios, uh, personal is going to do everything you need it to do. And what I mean by that is there's no core engine features that's in pro or plus that's not in the personal version. There are a couple of services that you get extra for pro and plus. Um, but the, the main catch is if you make more than a hundred thousand dollars per year, the company that this Unity version is for, if it makes more than $100,000 per year, not even necessarily from Unity itself, then you have to get uh, a, pl a plus or pro version. Now, there are a couple other benefits to using these, but they don't really matter that much. You, you won't have a custom splash screen if you use the personal version. You also won't have the dark skin if you use the personal version. But I personally use the personal version for everything I do, and it is no problem whatsoever. So we're going to click on Try Personal, and I'm going to go ahead and check that I confirm all this stuff here, of course. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to download the hub. Now, like I said, you can download the installer for the editor directly, but I don't want to do that. I want the hub. So I'm going to download Unity Hub. And I'm going to run this installer. And when you do, you're going to see a simple agreement to the terms of service. We know how to do that. Just going to agree to that. And if you want to read it, go ahead. And then we're going to select where we want to install it. 
Uh, in my case, I just keep it right inside the program files there. And now this shouldn't take too long to install simply because you're only installing the hub itself. You're not installing Unity itself at this point. So once this finishes though, we're gonna jump in there and we're gonna actually start installing the editor. And what we're gonna do here is once hub is open, we're gonna go to an installation tab. We're gonna go down to official releases and we're gonna find the latest version that's available. To me, it's 2018.2.2. 10F1. We're going to download that and then let it install. Now, whenever we click download, it's going to open up this window here that's going to allow us to select some components. There's a lot of stuff here, but the important thing to remember, you can always come back later and install what you do not have if you need it. In my case, I don't need Android build or iOS build or Linux or all that stuff down here. There's going to be a lot of options, a lot of different packages. But in my case, I just want the documentation and the latest version. And then we're going to click done. And when we do that, it's going to start installing that version of Unity with those settings. And again, you can always come back and add the components you need. Say maybe you decided, oh, I need to build for Android now. So you have to come get that package. Just run the installer the exact same way and install the components you need just like that. And that's going to be all we have to do to install Unity on our systems. In the next lesson, we're going to take this installed version of Unity and we're going to create a project and we're going to get started messing around in the Unity editor itself. And we're going to talk a bit about what the bits and pieces are and how some of the basic stuff works before jumping into some more of the in-depth stuff. That's the next lesson, guys. My name is Austin and I will see you there. Hey guys, welcome back. In this lesson, we're going to create our first Unity project and then we're going to go briefly over all of the UI stuff that we're going to see whenever we open up the editor. So let's just go ahead and do this really fast. I'm going to create a new project by clicking on new in the Unity Hub here. And it's going to bring up the new project panel. And I get to name my project. I'll call it Unity 101 Intro, something like that. And the version that I want to use is, I have a few installed here, but I want to use the latest available version to me, which is 18 to 10 F1. Our location's fine. And the template that I wanna use is gonna be 3D. What this is gonna do is it's going to build the workspace to work in a 3D type of game. Now, it's very easy to change this back to 2D if you want to, um, but in this case, we're just going to be working in 3D. So that's fine. I'm gonna click Create Project. Now, this is going to build our project for us, including everything it's going to need for us to make our game. And when you first open up the editor, open up our brand new project, this is what you should see. Now, for some reason you don't, just go up to the layout really fast here and go to default so we're on the same page and we can be talking about the same setup. So we have a lot of stuff going on here. There's a lot of panels, a lot of buttons, a lot of things happening, and it's probably pretty intimidating. But what I want to do is walk us quickly through some of the important things in a, in a brief way. And later on, we're going to cover most of the stuff in more depth and more detail when we're actually making our games and so on. So what I wanna do first of all, we'll talk about the toolbar up here. This has some tools that we're gonna be using throughout this course. We have the move tool, the transform uh, move tool, then we have the transform rotate, transform scale, and then a couple of other options that we'll get into a bit later on. What these allow us to do is simply manipulate and transform the objects in our game. And we'll talk about the, how that works here in the next lesson. And then out here we have the play, pause, and step buttons going to allow us to play the game and actually simulate the game in the editor, pause the game, so pause the execution of the game, and then just step through one at a time. And we'll talk a bit about that later on as well. Down to the left here we have the panel called the hierarchy. Now this is where everything in our scene, in our level, in whatever current level we have open, will be. So in this current scene that we have that it created by default, which is stored inside of our scenes folder here, we have a main camera game object and a directional light game object. Now these are objects, if I go to my scene view here, we can see the icons. These are objects, I'll be referring to them as game objects. They're just, that's just because they are actual objects in our game, makes pretty, pretty good sense. The camera, and we'll talk about these later on as well whenever we're using them, but just quickly, the camera is what the player is going to see. You can see what it sees here. That's what the game view is. It's the camera view. The light is simply going to light the objects based on some settings, and we could do some fancy stuff with that. Uh, but for now, very basic lighting and a very basic camera. 
and we can select them using the hierarchy here. Pretty cool, but you're seeing over here to the right, whenever I select something, I have some stuff pop up. And what's happening, and this is called the inspector, what's happening is I am seeing individual items on each of these objects. And make note of that, on the light here, I have a light uh, item and a transform item. These are called components. In our games, in Unity itself, Every game object is made up of components. So a light, directional light, has a light component on it. A camera has a camera component on it and an audio component because the camera has to pick up audio so the player can hear you. They both, you'll notice, have a transform component on it. That's what makes a game object a game object. If it has a transform component, that means it physically exists in your world. That's because this gives it a position, a rotation, and a scale. And for an object to exist, that's all it needs in our engine here, in, in our actual system. So this makes up game objects. And we'll be creating our own components to define our specific, unique game objects whenever we're creating our game. And we'll go into more detail about this uh, later on, but you can just see there's a lot of stuff happening here and there's a lot of settings you can tweak and all that. But we'll get into that when it's time. Down here we have the project window. This is going to be where we can actually explore and look through our project files. So if I were to actually right click in here and go to show and explore or finder if you're on a Mac, this will give me the actual project folder. You know what, Unity 101 intro? Assets, this is the asset folder here, and this is what we have in there. This is where we're going to store all of our resources. So our sprites or our models or our animations and our sounds, all that stuff. We're going to store those in our assets folder. That way we can reference them inside of our project. And you'll notice inside of the scenes folder, I have my sample scene here. Now this is already made for me with these objects in it. And then we have the console. Now this is where we're going to see um, if we want to print some information that the, same, that the game is outputting to ourselves. We wanna see like what is that value? I can go ahead and print that out and it will just log it in simple text format right here for us, just like you would get in a terminal or a command prompt, that kind of thing. And we'll be using this quite a bit throughout this course. So that's a lot to take in, but just to kind of get us going on this track, what I wanna do is talk a bit about uh, these panels, cause you, you may want to make your own setup here, your own layout, and we can do just that. I have a couple of things that I like to do. You probably will figure out the things you like to do. So what we can do is we can actually grab these tabs here and we can move these panels around and snap them into positions wherever we'd like. And if we don't have a snapping point like right here, I let go, I create a standalone window. And this can be placed, if I drag it off the screen here, it's on my other monitor, I can play over there. And I can bring it back. If I want to put it back in the same position, I grab the tab again and just slide it right into position right where it was. Maybe I want to take the game view and snap it off to the right side of the scene view there. So now I can see the scene view and the game view. That's pretty cool. And maybe I like this setup. What I could do to save this so I can always have this, I can go up to layout, I can go to save layout, and I can call it my layout. Now anytime I want this layout, I simply go up here and I go down to my layout and it will transform it into this layout. Pretty cool. Maybe I want to go back to the default one, though. I can go back over to my layout here and go to default, and there it is. So just in case you were to mess some stuff up and you have windows everywhere and you can't figure out how to get it back how you like it, just do that right there. Or you can go up to Window, Layouts, and you have the same options right here. And lastly, for this intro lesson here, let's talk a bit about what we actually have going on right here, right? We talked about the camera and, and the, and the, and the uh, light here, but this is the scene view. This is the everything that we can see in here is in this level. And to show you that, let me create a cube in my scene, in my level here, and we'll just work with that. I'll go right click, 3D object, cube, and there it is. You can see it in my scene view. And if I go to my game view, which is what the camera sees once again, you can see there's a cube there. Now it's not at a good angle, so we can't tell it's a cube. It looks like a square, but it's a cube. And if I wanted to have another look at this in the scene view, what I can do is I can hold down my middle mouse button and just click it down and drag. And that's gonna allow me to pan around. 
pretty cool. If I were to click and drag, simply going to allow me to select multiple objects. Left click and drag, I can select using a box tool, multiple objects. Now if I right click and drag, this allows me to have a perspective look, like I'm a person with a head and I'm looking around. That's pretty cool. Now if I hold down shift and I were to pan around, it speeds up the panning so I can actually move with a multiplier, which is pretty cool. And using this, I can just kind of move around here, move around my cube, just like that. But that can be kind of annoying. So one thing I can do is I can right click and while I'm holding down this perspective view and I have that eyeball up, I notice to the bottom right of the eyeball, there's what looks like W, A, S, and D keys. So if I hit W, I kind of walk forward like you would in an FPS or a, a free look camera style system here. And I can just kind of walk around like I'm in the game world. It's gonna be very helpful. And Q and E will go up and down. It's gonna be very helpful designing levels so you can kind of get in those nooks and crannies and move stuff around. Now, we can also do this by selecting these tools up here, the uh, pan tool here, the hand tool, move it around just like that. And hitting Q, W, E, R, T, and Y will change what tool we have selected. So hitting Q will bring up the hand tool, or we can just click the middle mouse button down. And currently, our scene view is in perspective mode, which is the standard 3D mode. So if we're looking in real life and we're looking out, we see perspective lines on things, right? We can see things fading out into the horizon. We see how uh, our, our vision of the objects, the size of the objects depends on the distance from us, what plane it is on from our view. And that's just how perspective view works. But there's another option here. If I were to click on this cube right here in the middle of this X, Y, and Z, if I were to click on that, it's going to change it to orthographic or isometric. And this is going to make every object, no matter what plane they're on from your viewport, the same size. They're going to appear to be on the same plane. So if I were to actually take another cube here, I'll make another cube by hitting Control D. And just for this case, I'm going to move this out. Now we'll talk about this later on, but just for this instance, I want to move this guy around just to show you what's happening. And we'll talk about transforming and moving and rotating and all that coming up in the next couple of lessons. But these guys are the same size, and they, they appear to be the same size here in isometric view. But if I switch back to perspective view, notice he appears to be quite far away now compared to this guy. And in fact, I can just move him further back, and the further he goes, the smaller it gets. That's just how 3D works. We know how that works, right? But what's interesting now, if I were to go back into isometric view, and I were to pan up here, there it is. Let me zoom out by scroll wheel. That's how you zoom in and out, the scroll wheel. They appear to be the same size on the same plane. And I'll be using both of these to actually build our game over the upcoming lessons. That's going to be it for this introductory lesson, guys. In the next lesson, we're going to start transforming some objects. We're going to take the objects and move them around and learn how to position objects where we want them in our game world. That's the next lesson, guys. My name is Austin, and I will see you there. Hey, guys. Welcome back. In this lesson, we're going to look at positioning objects in our scenes to get them exactly where we want them to be. And this is a very key part of level design and everything you're going to be doing in Unity. So we want to make sure that we nail this down and we understand everything that we need to. So in our current scene, we have a cube object in our scene here. And if I look up here now, we touched on this a second ago, but if I look up here now, I have a transform with a position, rotation, and scale. Now for this, we're going to focus on the position because we're going to be positioning objects in this lesson. And I see an X, Y, and Z value, and they're pretty crazy values, and we'll change those here in a second. And now what's important about this is that's how we position things in our world. We decide at what X, Y, and Z coordinate the object is. So if I were to take this and say X is zero, Y is zero, and Z is zero, that's gonna be directly in the center of our game world. Zero, zero, zero. And if I wanted to move it up one unit on the Y axis, I'll just put one on the Y axis. I can also have a more free form control of this by just grabbing the uh, move tool that we have selected here. I can just move it on the X axis just like this. It'll only move on the X axis if I do that. And the same goes for the Z and the Y. Now maybe I wanna move it on the Z and the X at the same time. Well, I'll grab green. And there we go. 
pretty cool. And the same goes for the red here. You can move it Y and Z. And then blue, move it on the X and Y. And to really get stuff moving around here, I can pan around using the middle mouse button. I can rotate using the right uh, click. I can also hold down shift to move faster. And don't forget, I can walk around in my game world. Now, what I want to do is let's create another cube here. I'll just select this cube and I'll hit Control and D on the keyboard and it will duplicate that cube. Now, when it duplicates, it's going to share the properties that cube has. It's a duplicate. So the X, Y, and Z are the same. The scale is the same. All that's the same. So I can't see it, but I have it selected. So what I can do is I can just move it out and have another cube there. Now I have two cubes. Now, one thing that's important is what if I wanted to place this cube directly up against this cube. I just want to place it right up against it. Now I could just drag this guy over on the Z axis just like this. And I could just try to get it to, you know, I can come in here and see like, okay, well how close can I get? It uh, looks pretty good right there, it's touching. But that's not exact, right? And I could probably figure out the math and do some math here and uh, position it like that. But the easiest way to do this is I can hold down Control and Shift. And doing this is going to enable the surface snap option for the move tool. Now, if I were to click and drag, notice once the mouse is over another surface, the object snaps to that surface, but it's wherever the mouse is hovering on the other object. So I can place it right up against the side of that, just like that. And well, now I have to say like, well, I want to get it to line up perfectly. It's going to be hard to do that. And I can't do that for another surface because there's not another surface there. So one way I can do this is I can snap vertices together. Now vertices, we know what a surface is, right? It's the face of the object here. That, that's a face, that's a face, that's a face. Now we have edges that connect these faces together. And in between those edges, we have vertices right here at the corner. We have vertice, it's a vertice or a, verte a vertex. That's a vertex. That's a vertex. So I can just snap these vertice, uh, vertices together by holding down V, hovering over the vertex that I want, and I'll just drag it, and it will snap to the nearest vertex available to it, just like that. Boom, there we go. Now we are right up against each other, just like we need to be. Or I could place it on top, place it off to the side. Now just a tip, what if I am I'm moving some stuff around here and this just gets way off screen somehow and I don't know where it's at. I'm trying to find it. I can't find it, but I want to find it. There's two ways I can do this. I can double click on the object I'm looking for. So I can double click on cube one here. It'll frame it right in the center for me. Or I can have an object selected and then just hit the F key and it will frame it in the center for me just like that. So you'll never get lost. Now let's position this back at zero, zero, zero. So what I wanna do is talk about some snap settings. Now we snapped surfaces together, we snapped vertices together, but now I wanna simply snap to a coordinate grid. You know, like I have one, um, think of like a, a, a bit of graph paper. We have the cells and you know, each one's like one unit across, whatever a unit is in your case. And I want to snap it to those units, to those cells. So one way I can do that is I can hold down the control key as I'm moving the object and it's going to snap to the grid. Now notice my Z axis up there is changing. Now my X will, and then the Y, and you can also do it with multiple axes at one time. Pretty cool. But what if I don't want it to move one at a time? Well, I can fix that by going up to edit down to snap settings and I can change this right here. It can change them on the individual axis as well and also scale and rotation snapping, which we don't need that for this. Let's say I have this off position here and I wanna snap it to, uh, to be one unit each. I could just have it selected and say snap all axes and it snaps them all to the nearest unit that matches our snap settings. Or I could just say, well, I wanna snap just the X or I wanna snap just the Z and then just the Y, but the Y is already there, so then just the Y. Pretty cool. So that's a good way to start moving stuff around if you need a uniform type of layout for your level. And now for a little challenge. This is going to get you a bit more familiar with moving objects around with a purpose. So what I have here is if you were to unzip the positioning challenge zip file and open it up in Unity, you're going to take the messed up tree here and you're going to make it into a tree. Now everything is already rotated and scaled in the way it should be. You just have to place it 
in the same position it's in right here. And you're gonna be doing this by moving the objects around like we just were. You're going to be snapping surfaces together, vertices together, and so on. So go ahead and pause the video, try to do that yourself. And if you get stuck, don't worry, we're gonna cover how to do it right when you come back. All right, so now once you've extracted it, if you've already finished the challenge, great. If not, we're gonna cover how to do it. Let's go into position challenge, go into assets and go into scenes and open up challenge.unity and click open. And this is what you get. So let's look around here. What I see we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to move the topper here to the top of the tree. We're gonna have to move the limb down and we're gonna have to move these bits and pieces of the leaves to match up. So first of all, let's move the main top of the tree. It's gonna be this guy right here called top. And to do this, what I can do is I can hold down shift control and we're gonna snap the surface of this bottom to the top of the trunk. So it's gonna drag, point over the top of the trunk and let go. There we go, pretty cool. And we're gonna do the same thing for this limb. Now it doesn't have to be exactly where I put it, obviously, just kind of close to get an idea of how this works. So we're gonna select it again, shift control, drag, point at the surface. I think it looks good probably right there. And now for these other objects here, I'm just gonna bring this guy down. Now again, we could try to position him like this and that may work if you take your time, but how about I just grab the V key here and grab a vertex and snap it to that vertex. Look in the game view, we can see that's right, perfect. And the same goes for this one. We'll just grab this vertex, top right corner, and we'll snap it to the tree vertex just like that. And you can see how this can help you building your objects, building your world, your scenes, your levels, all these things. This is an important thing to understand how to do perfectly so you can do this without any problems. Now I wanna take this, uh, the branch top here and actually add it to the end of the branch. So I'm just gonna again, shift control. I'm gonna drag this, point at the surface I wanna put it on, right there it works. And then all I have to do is position this object right here. And now maybe I wanna put it in a different position. Maybe I can put it in the bottom right right here. Just like that. Look in the game view, that's what you get. Looks kind of like a tree, right? Pretty cool. So that's gonna be it for this lesson, guys. Hope you enjoyed it. In the next lesson, we're going to look at rotation transformations. So we're gonna be rotating objects around, and we'll have another little basic challenge to learn how to use that in a real world scenario. My name is Austin, guys, and I will see you in the next lesson. Hey guys, welcome back. In this lesson, we're going to look at another transformation. And this time it's going to be on rotations. So if we look at our transform component again here, we have rotation X, Y, and Z. So let's think about what these are. These are angles on individual axes. So we have the X, Y, and Z axis. And if we were to rotate on specifically the X axis, we would rotate around or about that axis. And we'll be doing this using Euler angles. Euler angles are a way to define individual rotations for objects based on individual axes. So if we have a rotation along the x-axis and the z-axis, that'll give us our final rotation. But we have to rotate the x-axis, then the y-axis, and then the z-axis. So what does that mean? Well, let's grab the rotation tool and let's look at this and see how it works. So if I click on the rotation tool here, we have this new gizmo pop up here. And I can see if I hover over this, when I hover over the lines here, they change to a different color. They're interactable, so I can actually click on them and drag. But what does what do these lines mean? Well, the blue one here, if I look at this, uh, the z-axis is going straight through this object from where I'm looking up. If I were to click on the z-axis and actually face the object on the z-axis here, what I can see is the blue circle goes around the z-axis and it's blue because the axis is blue so if i grab this and i rotate on the z-axis by just dragging my mouse left and right just like that now look at the transform component up here when i'm going to the left once i get to where my original rotation was i'm at about zero at the moment if i go to the left of that it starts going in the negatives so i'm rotating on the negative if I'm going to the right, it's growing. 
Once I get back to zero, back to my original position, then I go to the right of that, then it is going to go in the positives. And the same thing applies for the other axes. So the x-axis, rotate around that. And then the y-axis. Let's add a rotation to this. 45 on the y, 45 on the z. So now, if I were to move this on the z-axis, it moves just like you'd expect it to in world space. But what if I want to move it based on the rotation of the object? So right now, the object is rotated. If I look at the uh, rotation gizmo here and I rotate it again, I could just really get a, a mess of rotation happening here. And then I want to move it in the direction that is rotated and I can't, there's not a way to do that here. So what I can do is I can change the uh, to toggle tool handle rotation. Currently tool handles are in global rotation. So I want to set the tool handles to be in local rotation. So if I click that, it'll switch it over to local. And now it's based on the local rotation of the object. So it's using a local coordinate system. So instead of using the global coordinate system where Y is this way, now Y is this way because of the rotation. So move it along the Y, that's what you get. Move it along the Z, move it along the X. It's a local coordinate system now as opposed to a world coordinate system. And of course, you can apply snapping to this if I hold down uh, control, just like I did before. I could snap in whatever increments I have defined in snap settings. In this case, 15 degree increments are defined. And if I just want to grab it and freely rotate, I can just grab anywhere in the sphere here and just rotate just like that. But that can get pretty messy pretty fast. So you want to be careful doing that. And if I get to a point where I want to just reset it back to zero, I can go up here and I can say zero, 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 or I can just click this little settings cog icon here and do reset rotation or even reset position. So now to play around with this, let's actually solve a challenge. I have another challenge for you. This time we're going to be building a bridge-like structure, like a little support bridge. So unzip the rotation challenge zip file, open it up in Unity like we did before, and then we're going to try to build this bridge. So go ahead and pause the video, give it a shot, and if you can't figure it out, just come back here and we'll work it out together. No sweat on that. Don't have to be too specific about it. Just get it as close as you can or make it look like you want it to look. Just play around with the rotation tools enough to the point where you understand what you're doing. And whenever you uh, get finished there, come back here, unpause the video, and we will solve the challenge. All right, so after you've unzipped the rotation challenge, open it up. Again, go to Assets, Scenes, and open up Challenge.Unity. And so what I want to do is I want to take these beams here and I want to select both of them. We're going to rotate them in because we're going to have these beams facing this direction like this. And these over here are going to be facing this direction like this. Then we'll have those on top and so on. So if I select both of these by holding down control and clicking on both of them, what I can do is I can hold down control as I'm dragging along the Z axis here. And we'll get the 15 degree increments, right? So I want to rotate 45 degrees. So it'll go three increments. Three times 15 is 45. And that's going to be 45 degrees on the z-axis, or in this case, negative 45 degrees on the z-axis. And now what I want to do is I want to position these. So I'm going to hit W on my keyboard to bring up the Move tool. And I want to select each individual one. And again, we're going to do the vertex snapping here. So I'm going to grab the outside vertex and just snap it to the vertex of the bridge right there on the top outside. And the same goes for this one. Grab the outside of that one and snap it to the outside of the bridge just like that. And now we're going to do the same thing for these over here, except on the opposite direction. So holding down control, select both of those. We're going to hit E to bring up the rotation tool. And then holding down control, we're going to drag one, two, three. That's 45 degrees on the Z axis there. We can also just type it in as 45 degrees. And do the same thing again here. I want to grab the move tool, grab V, and just position this guy. We're going to try to position both of them at the same time. Just like that. And now quickly, we'll just take these posts here. I'll grab them both by holding down control again. And I'm going to rotate these zero degrees on the uh, Y axis and get them lined up just like this. And just holding down V to grab the vertex, snap it into position at the top of that one. Same goes for this one. And then for these, we're going to rotate them. They have to be laying flat to go from here to there. So we're going to rotate them on the X axis. Get rid of the Y rotation, I don't know why that's there. And on the X axis, we're going to rotate it 90 degrees. There we go. And again, holding down V, 
grab that vertex, snap it into place. Same goes for this zero there, 90 degrees on the X. Grab the vertex, snap it in to position, grab that vertex in fact, snap it into position, and there we go. Now, there's no one way to do that. There's a bunch of ways you can come about doing that. I'm just showing you one solution, and I'm sure you guys can figure out your own. So that's going to be it for this lesson, guys. In the next lesson, we're going to look at scaling, and we're going to see how we can use it in the same way we're using transform, rotation, and position. So that's the next lesson, guys. My name is Austin, and I will see you there. Hey guys, welcome back. In this lesson, we're going to talk about scaling our objects. Now we've done the position and the rotation when it comes to the transform component. If I look at this, the next one available to us is the scale of the object. Now this does what you probably think it'll do. It's going to resize the object, but how does it do that? Well, we can see it has a scale for this cube of one, one, one. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that the cube is one unity unit by one unity unit and uh, just remember that a unity unit is typically going to be a single meter now that's only relevant whenever it comes to calculating physics and, and stuff like that in unity as there's not anywhere you'll find that it defines that it is in fact a unit uh, equals a meter because you can make up your own units and say well I want the unit to be a foot. I want the unit to be uh, 10 centimeters. I, it doesn't really matter what you want it to be. It's up to you. But in this case, the cube, when you create it, is one unit by one unit. Even though the scale says one, 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 that has nothing to do with that. If I were to take the scale and make it uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, now my cube is half a unit by half a unit. But it's only because all I did was have the scale. I took the scale and I just cut it in half. So now my object is half the size. And if I were to go up to two, 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 my object is twice the original size, two units by two units. But keep in mind, I can have an object that is uh, 10 units by seven units and the scale would be one, one, one. Now, if I made the scale two, to two, it would just be double the units. We're just multiplying it by that value. So if I had, to keep it simple, we had a two by two square, a two by two cube, and I set the scale to be two on X, Y, and Z. Then we're gonna multiply those values by two, 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 and that's gonna equal four. It's gonna have a four by four cube. So the way we can work with this is, as you saw, we can just input the numbers. We know how to do that. Or we can just grab the scale tool here by hitting the R key on our keyboard. And we've done this before, worked with these gizmos, right? So it's just uh, the same thing here. Just grab the axis you want to work with and just start doing something with it. So I'm just grab the Z axis here and I'm going to start dragging. And it will scale whatever angle I'm dragging in. Pretty cool, right? Pretty simple stuff. And you can see the scale affected here. Now, if I were to come down, let's just put this back at one, one, one. If I were to come down on well, the X axis and we'll come down below zero. So what's going to happen? It's going to go into the negatives, right? So if I had a one by one by one cube and I'm, and I scaled it by negative one on all axes, it appears to be a one by one by one cube. And it would be, we're just inverting the scale. We're not, it's not removing the size from it, right? we're inverting the entire scale. And I can just keep going this way with it if I wanted to. Now, this isn't ideal, but it's just the way the scaling system works because we're multiplying it by that value. If we multiply four by negative four, or four by negative one, we just have negative four, right? If we don't have zero, zero would just be, doesn't exist, it's gone. And now that we've talked about move, rotation, and scale, I want to talk about this combo tool here, which has move, rotate, and scale all in one. Now, <laughs> there's a reason I didn't bring this up at the start, because this is a very confusing looking tool if you don't know what these individual tools do. But now that we know what they do, we can look at this and say, oh, okay, that's just a move gizmo inside of a rotation gizmo, and it's wrapped with a scale gizmo. I can just scale it. I can rotate it, and then I can move it, all in one. 
pretty cool. And that's really all there is to scale in Unity. So in the next lesson, we are going to talk about parent-children relationships, at least when it comes to Unity. That's in the next lesson, guys. My name is Austin, and I will see you there. Hey, guys. Welcome back. In this lesson, we're going to talk about parent-children relationships. These relationships are very important to understand when it comes to working with Unity, as you'll be having lots of children throughout your career. So what I want to talk about is uh, we have this cube, right? That's fine. He can he's, he's his own thing. He has his own position and rotation and scale. And it's relative to the world, right? The world is is where this cube lives. And that works fine. So let's create another object and just see what we can do with it. I'll just create another cube here. And this guy is right. Oop, let me scale him up accidentally. This guy's over here and he's also just in the world. He is relative to the world. We move him around. His position is, you know, world position. Negative 10, negative 0.6, negative 0.3. That's just a world position. So what we can do is we can change that relativity from the world to another object. So instead of being positioned relative to the world coordinate system, you can be positioned or scaled or rotated to another object's local coordinate system. So how does this work? If I take this cube and I drag it and drop it on that other cube, it becomes a child in the hierarchy here of that cube. Pretty cool. So now if I just simply grab this cube, the, the parent cube, and move it, they both move, right? That makes sense. Uh, if I were to grab the scale tool and scale, they both scale. That makes sense. And then the rotation as well. So the parent creates a relationship with a child that makes the child's position, rotation, and scale related and reliant upon the parent. So that means, let me just take the parent here and I'll position it at zero, zero, rotate at zero, scale one, one. Just default settings there. And then my cube, these are the settings. And if I were to say, uh, let's put it at zero, zero, zero. Scale one, one, one. Okay, we can't see it because it's inside that cube in the same position, same rotation, same scale. So let's take the, the parent now. Let's move him off to the side. And this is the new position for the parent. Look at the cube. Zero, zero, zero. Even though the, 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 other, the cube, the child, is in the same position, we have zero, zero, zero. That's because the position is relative to the parent. So if I move it now off to the side... It's moving the position relative to the parent. But still, if I move the position of the parent, the child moves as well. And this, this applies to all of the transformations. So if I were to rotate the parent, even though the child is rotating with it, locally, the child has not rotated at all. And the same goes for the scaling. Even though it scaled, it did not scale locally. And one thing we'll run into is there's no way around um, if, if the parent rotates, the child rotates. If the parent moves, the child moves. If the parent scales, the child scales. Because it's relative uh, to the parent, when the child is at scale 111, that 111 is multiplied by the child's actual size, not by whatever the parent has modified it to be, whatever the parent has transformed it to be. And that's a very important thing to understand. So where would this be useful? Let's say you have a character here. Let's just create this guy. It's this cube here. Let's say he is a character. And let's just position him at zero, zero. We'll scale him one, one, one and rotate it none. And in fact, I want to scale the character. Uh, we'll, we'll make him too tall. And also the, that goes two, two, but that's fine. We'll scale it uh, two on the Y. So two times one is two. And then on this, what I'll do is I'll just make it not a child for a second and notice the scale changes, right? Because it's no longer related to the parent, but it didn't want to reset the scale. It just said, okay, well now we're just going to take whatever the parent's transformation was and make that my base transformation because now I'm rel uh, relative to the world. So what I want to do is take that and we'll make it one. Actually, in fact, we'll make it about 0.5 on the Y, 0.5 on the Z, and we're just going to make a little gun. This is a little gun this guy has. This is our character, and this is his gun. He's holding a gun. So what I can do is take the gun, 
add it to the character. I'll call it gun. And now if we if we move the character around, the gun moves, right? So if we're walking, da, 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 the gun moves. We don't have to move the gun individually from the player. And the same goes for rotating. If I rotate, the gun stays relative to the player. It doesn't matter what's going on. I can do all the things at once here, and it does not care what it's doing. It'll stay relative to the player. It will not move positions. That's going to be it for this lesson, guys. In the next lesson, we're going to look at materials. Materials, materials, materials. We're going to be adding some cool colors to some objects and playing around with materials. That's in the next lesson. My name is Austin. I will see you there. Hey guys, welcome back. In this lesson, we're going to talk about materials, what they are and how we can use them in Unity. So first of all, what is a material? A material is a way to define how a object's going to render when it comes to color, when it comes to textures, reflections, things like that. So we can determine a lot of different settings, a lot of different looks and styles, simply by creating materials and applying them to our objects. So if I look at my cube here, with it selected and I go over to the inspector, I can see that, uh, first of all, I have a mesh renderer. Now this is used to render our actual model, our mesh here. We have a very basic mesh. But if I were to uncheck this, I can see that the mesh is gone, right? Uh, it's completely gone, but I can see the bounding box is still there. And I can look at lighting and we can look at materials here. We have some settings to determine how this mesh is rendered. Now, we don't care about any of these things in this uh, situation right now. What I care about is what the materials thing is doing here. So I have a default material assigned to this mesh. And with that, that's how we get the, the, the white surface on this object. But we don't want that. We want to create our own material. So the way I can do that is I can right click, go to create and go to material. Now, before I do that, though, I'm going to create a folder for all of our materials to be in just to organize things a bit. And I want to go to create, create material. And for this one, I will just call it uh, just material for now. So what we have over here is pretty confusing, right? There's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of stuff we're not going to touch on. A lot of stuff you may never, ever use, and that's fine. It's there if you need it. But uh, what we're looking at right now is the base material for Unity. It's using the shader called the standard shader. Now a shader handles how stuff displays to you, how it's rendered on the screen, how the individual pixels are handled, what color goes where, that kind of thing. Now we're not gonna go into that kind of detail when it comes to textures and materials and stuff. Shaders can be very complex things and we're not going to worry about that. We're gonna worry about the settings the shader allows us to play with because we're not creating our own custom shaders. We're just using the awesome built-in standard shader from Unity. And it's a really powerful shader to use because it gives us the ability to do all kinds of things with it. We can create glass, we can create smooth, like metallic surfaces, we can create shiny, glossy surfaces, we can create rough, coarse, wood-like surfaces, just with these settings. Now, we're not gonna be doing anything cool like that at the moment, but we're just gonna go over some of the settings and see what they do. So starting off though, do make sure you have the standard shader selected. There's a bunch of stuff here to play around with, but for now, we're just gonna play around with the standard shader. And what I wanna do to assign this shader to my cube is I can just drag and drop it. Now, nothing changed because I haven't changed any settings here, but when we start doing that, you'll see some stuff changed. But now if I go to my cube, I can see that I have material assigned, not um, whatever it was called before, uh, standard material or something like that. So now it's just material. If I select that, we can see material is what's assigned. So the first option that we have is rendering mode, but we'll get to that here in a second. The first option that matters that we have is albedo. It's just simply the base color of this material. And so I can just change this by clicking on that color there and just changing it to whatever color I would like it to be. Let's give it a cool purple color. Let's get on the side the lights on so we can see it. And there we go. So we have a purple cube now, pretty simple stuff. And then we have transparency going from zero all the way up to one. So the way we can do that is we can go to changing the rendering mode to transparent, and then I'll just change the alpha on that color to be transparent. Now you can see through the cube. 
pretty cool, right? But the next thing we have is metallic, the metallic setting. The metallic value determines the amount of environmental reflections to albedo color. Now that doesn't make much sense how I wrote that there, but what I mean is the, uh, the higher the, uh, the metallic setting, the more reflections you'll get from your environment. And as a result of that, the less albedo color you'll get that'll come through. So if you have a really bright red as your albedo color and you take the metallic all the way up, well, you're going to lose a lot of that bright red because it's going to be, it's going to be replaced with the reflections that it has to show you. So if we were to show that now, I don't have any cool objects to reflect or anything, but we can play around with this. Let's add a ground. I'll create a plane object. I'll just drag it down here and we'll scale it up on the X and the Z. Let's make a big ground. And what I want to do, in fact, is I want to create another object. I'm just going to create a sphere. This will give us a good idea of how this works. So I'll bring this sphere over here. And I'll create a new material by going over this material, control D, and I will call this metallic. And I'll just add this to my sphere. And what I want to do is just play with a metallic setting here. And if we increase the metallic setting all the way up to one, and then we take the smoothness all the way up, we see that we start to get a very shiny looking ball, right? This looks like a, a metal ball, like a very shiny, maybe a chrome ball, if we were to change the color of this here. But you can see if we were, if we take the metallic all the way down and the smoothness all the way down, we get our base albedo color, which is what we mean whenever we increase the metallic, we start losing that albedo color to replace it with reflections. But if we increase the smoothness, we can start to see the reflection come through as the skybox. Notice we have a skybox wrapping our world here. You can see the skybox reflecting in our sphere. Let's duplicate this sphere. We'll add him right here. And let's duplicate the texture. Add that texture to that. And we'll just create a transparent texture. Now we just did this, so we know what to do. We go to transparent. And then we could just take and lower the alpha. But again, remember for the albedo to really shine through, which is what the alpha is affecting, the metallic has to go down or we're just showing the reflections of the world around us. Then we could change this to a different color. So if we look at what smoothness is doing, what it's actually doing is it's changing how the light scatters once it hits the object's surface. And we can see that happening here. It adds a bit of a roughness, a, a texture, depending on the value of the setting. The smoother it is, you know, the, the light's going to bounce uniformly. So the average of that ray will all be the same, right? They'll be the exact same. But then you add a little bit of roughness here, you start getting more spread. You see it starts spreading out and you're going to average these together and you're going to get a weirder effect. And eventually averaging them together is going to give you the effect that you see whenever you have the shininess versus the softness. And just to more of an extreme here. So we can, we can see this in a different image here. If I look at the top, this is with a low smoothness. This is with a medium smoothness, and this is with a high smoothness. The high smoothness, they all are bouncing uniformly, as we saw here, uniformly. And here they're all bouncing, you know, in the, in the middle, as we see here, they're kind of going off here and there. But if you average these together, it's not too bad. And then if you look at the top here, they're just going all over the place. I mean, again, they look uniform because they are averaged together. If you were to calculate every single individual beam and use that, that would be ridiculous. It'd be crazy. So they average them together and they get an average of where they would be. And this is what you get from that. Now keep in mind, this only affects the lighting calculation. It doesn't affect what the actual texture of the surface looks like. It just affects how the light affects it, how the light interacts with it. Let's duplicate this cube and we'll make a, a light emitting texture here. So I'm going to duplicate transparent and I will call it emission. And now on emission, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it a, let's make it a bright green color, alpha all the way up. And I'm going to bring the metallic down, the smoothness down, and I'm going to set it to be opaque. And I'm going to grab this cube, pull it out, put it right there, and it'll grab the emission and drop it on that. So now what I want to do is I'm going to check the emission box here, and I'm going to grab the color, and I want it to be just a really green color, really bright green color. And what this is going to do is it's going to not rely on a light to be 
uh, lighting up this object. It can light itself up. It's not directly emitting a light on its own at the moment. It just doesn't require a light to be lit up in a scene. So if I were to take this light here and disable it, everything else is dark. We can't see all the other stuff very well, but this is clearly lit, right? You can see it just fine. So if I were to grab this and we were to play around with it a bit more, we can just see the emission color coming out big time. Now, what this could be useful for is maybe you have a screen display on a console somewhere and it's like a dark corner. You think that should still be visible to you in the dark, right? It's, it's, it should be lighting itself. It has its own uh, backing light so you can see the screen in the dark. Well, that works for this. If I were to turn the intensity of this light down, we can see it's still very visible. Pretty cool. And the last thing I want to talk about is going to be uh, one that we can actually add a texture to. So these are all pretty cool. They're just colors though. What if I want to add a texture to something? How can I do that? So to do that, I'll first have to grab a texture. I have a little wood texture here I'm going to grab and just drag it into Unity. And that's exactly how we're going to import our texture. Just drag and drop. Could not be easier. So I want to create a material for this. I'll just duplicate the transparent material once again. And I'll call it texture. And on this one, we're going to turn it back to opaque, increase the alpha all the way. And we're just going to remove the, the metallic setting and put this back at 0.5. We're just going to reset all of that just like that. And now what we want to do is we're going to add this to our floor. Our floor is now this big blue floor. And to add that texture to our material, I'm going to click the circle next to albedo here. And I'm going to select my texture. And it's going to place the texture on my object. What it's going to do, though, is it's going to stretch it to fit the entire object. And that's not exactly what I want. What I would like is for it to tile. I have a very tileable texture here. I want it to tile. So to do that, I'll go down to the tiling. And I will say maybe this will tile. I don't know how many times it should tile. That's too many, I think. Maybe it'll tile five times. And I also want to get rid of the blue albedo because, as you can see, you can still use an albedo with a texture, but it's going to tint the texture, whatever color you have the albedo, which is really cool if you want that kind of control over this. But in my case, I just want the cool brown floors. And we can work with this just like we worked with everything else. We can change the smoothness, the metallic setting, however we want to do this. And that's going to be it for this lesson, guys. In the next lesson, we're going to get started talking about programming in Unity using C Sharp. That's going to start happening in the next lesson, guys. My name is Austin Gregory, and I will see you there. Hey, guys, welcome back. In this lesson, we're going to have an intro into programming. So we're going to talk about the basics of what programming is, not necessarily specific to C Sharp and Unity, just what it actually is and what it means to write uh, some code or a script, that kind of thing. And then we're going to jump into Unity, and we're going to talk a bit more about it in detail, looking at the Unity script files. So first of all, the basics of programming. So what is programming in the most basic form? You're going to be creating commands to tell the computer what to do, and then you're going to tell it when to execute those commands. And a command can be anything you can think of. But if you think about a computer, they are on their own. They're very dumb. They don't know anything unless you tell them something. They don't know what to do unless you tell them to do it. So that's what we have to do. We have to actually write the commands and then tell the computer to do it. They're really good at listening. That's the whole thing about it. They're good at listening, just not good at coming up with stuff on their own. And we also get to control the execution with conditions and logic. So that means if we have a command, we can say we execute this command if a condition is met. So for instance, this first thing here, we have an action one, action two, action three. We're going to perform these actions in order, right? We're going to perform action one. What is action one? Let's say it is knead the dough. Action two is put the dough in a pan. And then action three is put the pan in an oven. Okay, so we are baking some bread. And we have to do it and break it down in individual actions. Action one. Now you would have more detail. You have to make the recipe first, you know, and everything together to make the dough. Then do all that stuff and then bake it. And then after that, you have to do whatever you have to do to make bread. I don't know how to make bread. Uh, but that's just the, the gist of the actions. You're going to perform them in order from top to bottom, 
But then you can have a condition. You can say, hey, if this condition is true, perform an action. If the condition is not true, then don't perform that action. So if we think about it in the sense of a game, our player will take damage if we are struck by a bullet. So if player was struck by a bullet, take damage. So if player was struck by a bullet, if that is true, then the action I want to perform is the take damage action, whatever that may be. There's a lot of things here, right, that, that, that can apply to anything you want to do as long as it's summed up in an action and as long as the thing you want to check for is summed up in a condition. Now, we're going to talk exactly about what this is. I just want you to understand this is the basics of programming. So variables are very important as well. And if you're familiar with algebra, then you've worked with variables before. So X is equal to five. The same thing applies here, except we're not limited to integers. We're not limited to numbers. Uh, we can have strings of text. We can have true or false. We can have all kinds of data types. Uh, we're going to focus uh, right now on string, integer, and Boolean. String is, like I said, a string of text. Integer is, as you know, a, a 1, 2, a 10, a 20. A Boolean is a true or false. Then you have floating point values, which can have a decimal points up to a certain amount. Then you have double values, which can have decimal points uh, beyond that amount. All kinds of types we're going to touch on throughout this course. Here's an example. We have a string called my name, and I'm just assigning it my name of Austin. And notice it's text, so it's in quotes. Then we have my age, which is an integer, INT, and it is assigned as 25, no quotes, as it is just a number. You only need quotes for the text. Now, for methods, these are a bit more complex, and we're going to talk a bit about them uh, in more detail in the next lesson. But for instance, methods allow you to package up a bunch of commands, and then if you were to call that method, invoke that method, it will call all of the commands and perform all of the commands in that method. So if you have, like I was talking about baking the bread, if you have all of those three commands within one method and then you call that method, let's say the method's called uh, bake bread. So whenever I tell the computer, okay, bake bread, it'll go through those actions one at a time and do what it's supposed to do. And that's the gist of methods and functions. So here's an example. I have my name and my age again. And then down here, I have a method defined. The method is going to log out my name and log out my age. And by log, I just mean show it to me in the console. Let me see the text values of this. And then whenever I call the name of this method, like I do here, perform log name and age, then it will do both of these actions in order. Now, this is not what C Sharp looks like. It's more pseudo code. It's more, um, it just kind of looks like code in general. But we'll talk a bit about the syntax so syntax is a lot like just grammar and syntax in, say, the English language, right? You have periods and commas and semicolons and all this stuff that, that means something syntactically in your language. And it's the same thing in programming languages. You have symbols and things that you have to use in certain positions to denote certain things. And it's very important that you understand the syntax of the language you're talking about. And we're going to touch on this a lot more later on, but I just want to give you an example of what the actual code will look like. So for character name, and we have again in quotes here, we're saying it's a string called character name. So string is the type of variable. Character name is what I'm calling the variable. This is the name of the variable. So instead of X equal in 25, character name equals Lannister. And again, just text within quotes. And then instead of a period at the end, I'm adding a semicolon. And this just tells the, uh, the computer that this is the end of this action. This is the end of that. And this is called a statement in our language. This is a statement. You end each statement with a semicolon. Then it knows, okay, the next thing I see is a new statement until I see another semicolon. And the same thing here is int character age equal to 46. And now we have a method called start. Now in Unity, as long as we're using a certain thing called a model behavior, which we will be, we'll talk about a bit about that later on, this will start and this will be executed It'll be called, it'll be invoked, it'll be performed um, at the start of, in, in, a, in a sense, the game, whenever the object is started. So when that happens, like I said before, it'll do the actions in order, right? So this will do a print, my name is, character name, print, my age is, character age. It'll do these one at a time, print, and then whatever it wants to print. And all this will do is it will just show it to me in the in the console, right? Uh, just It'll just print text to me so I can read that data in the editor, in the console. And print is a method. 
and we're passing in arguments to the method, in this case, one argument. The argument I have to tell print is, hey, I want you to show this in the console. This being my name is character name. Now, the additional sign here is, we'll talk a bit about this later on as well, but this is just uh, concatenating character name onto the end of my name is. So instead of having two separate strings here, we are actually gonna form one string from these two strings. And just that space is there just to space out the name from is because it becomes one sentence. Same goes for my age is. Now what's interesting here is a character age is an integer, but print prints out strings of text. And we'll talk about a bit about that later on as well. But what's important here is types in C sharp are important. They are very important. If you're working with something that needs a string of text, you have to give it a string of text. If you're working with something that needs a true or false, you have to give it a true or false. If you do not, it will not know what to do, right? Like I said, they're very dumb. They only know what they are told. So we have to tell it everything. And it knows if I'm looking for an int, I have to have an int. But in this case, print, whenever I pass in this string here and I, and I concatenate on the end of that an integer, well, it's smart enough to understand, at least smart enough to understand that if I try to do this, I want to at least convert this to a string and then add it to it. I can understand that far. I know to try to convert this to a string value and then just tack it on to the end of that. So next, this code that we're talking about, it's in a script file, right? You place all of this within a script file. It's gonna be uh, like sword.cs, C sharp. It's gonna be the name of the file. And then you attach these files to objects in your game. So let's say you have a sword object in your game. Just picture like a, a sword model, right? A 3D model in your game. Well, if you add this script file to that model, then whatever code you write will directly be on that model in a sense, right? That's the idea. So you take and you write your sword.cs file, your script file here, then you attach it to your sword object in your game world, and then you have a sword. Pretty cool. So let's talk about this in the editor. Let's create our first script file, and we'll talk about some of the basics of what Unity generates for us at the start. So back in Unity, what I wanna do is I wanna create a folder then I wanna keep all of my scripts in. I like to organize it this way, have all my scripts within one folder, and maybe within this folder, I'll have multiple folders as well uh, to separate types of scripts, but uh, just a separate folder here for my scripts. And I did that by right-clicking, going to Create, and then Folder. You can also go to your Explorer by right-clicking, going to Show and Explore, go into the Assets folder, which is this folder right here, as you can see, and you can create a new folder like you would in your operating system of choice. So in my scripts folder, what I wanna do is I wanna right click again, I wanna go to create, and I wanna create a C sharp script. And this will create a script file for me that I can add a name to. Let's call this character. We're gonna write a character C sharp script file. Now, once I hit enter and I name my script file that, with it selected, I see over in the inspector that we talked about a couple lessons ago, I see the contents of this script file. We have a bunch of stuff here that we don't know what it is, right? But we talked about this start method here. We don't really know what void is or what these parentheses mean or any of that, but that's fine. We'll talk about that here in a second. But this is just the contents that Unity will generate for us by default whenever we create our script file. So let's double click on this and it will open it up in your uh, IDE of choice, your integrated development environment of choice. Now, by default on Windows in Unity, you'll open up Visual Studio 2017, and if you did not have VS 2017 installed, uh, the installation will install it for you as it's required to write. You need to have some type of editor installed. Now, if you're on Mac, you may have Visual Studio Code or you may have Mono Develop, one of those things, but in the end, you'll have the text in front of you that looks like what I have here, maybe just uh, zoomed out a bit. So what do we have? Well, we have a lot of stuff going on. Notice the name of this thing called a class is character. Character is what I call that script file. That makes sense, right? So the class name has to match our script file name. If it doesn't, you'll already have an error that you have to fix. So make sure that matches your script file name. 
So we talked about these statements and what they do and, and uh, what it actually means to make a command of some sort, right? And we talked about methods being wrappers for um, multiple commands to do something in bulk or do something at once. But if we look at this thing I called a method earlier, this start method here, it's called start. That's the name of the method. And then to the left of that, we have void. And this is just the return type, which doesn't matter at the moment. Uh, we'll talk about that later on, but just understand that this means there is no return. It doesn't have a return type. Now you could return a value. Let's say start were to calculate, uh, you know, the sum of two numbers, a plus b. So five plus five is ten, and you wanted to get that value, you would have a return value here of maybe an integer, right? It would return an integer. But like I said, we'll talk about this later on when it's more important to us. Then we have the name of the method, and then to the right of that we have parentheses. All methods are denoted by parentheses to the right of the name. And things can go in here called parameters, but again, we'll talk about that later on. Now, to the right of that, we have curly braces. Now, if you've ever worked with any programming language ever, you probably know what this does. But everything inside of these curly braces, top and bottom, the open brace and the closing brace, everything within that is contained by start. Everything within that belongs to start. So anything I write in here, start has access to it, start owns it, start controls it. Same goes for update down here. Notice how I said start executes at the start. Well, update executes every single frame. It's a method as well that Unity uh, provides for us. Uh, but don't uh, worry, we can create our own methods. Any kind of method we want to create, it can do anything we want it to do. That's the beauty of programming. And these are just the default methods that we get. We also get a ton more we'll talk about later on. And they also have the uh, opening and closing braces. Everything's defined the same. But for now, let's get rid of this method as we don't need it. And we'll just work with just the start method here. What I want to do is I just want to do what I was talking about by showing something in the console. Now, if we look in Unity, the console... There's a tab here called console, and this is just like the terminal on Windows, the, the command prompt. Uh, you can just log out some information here from your program. So I can just type print, that's the name of the method. And like I said, all methods have parentheses. And then inside those parentheses, you'll pass in some data. And print just wants to know what string of text do you want to print? Well, I'll just print, hello there. Just like that. So now print will take hello there and show it in the console to me. This is an action. This is a command. This is what we want to do. We want to create a bunch of these to control our game and our program. But I have a red squiggly around here, and you'll see a bunch of these throughout your programming career. But what this means is something's wrong somewhere. So there's an error somewhere and you need to fix it. And all this means is we have not ended our statement with a semicolon. And the beautiful thing about working with a language like C Sharp and a, uh, an environment like Visual Studio is the error handling system, the error reporting system, everything uh, that you need to help you program are really fine tuned and they work really well. So I want to add my semicolon there. But remember how I said script files are attached to objects in your game. They have to be or they will never be executed because start is executed whenever whatever this uh, script file is on is uh, enabled, is, is created. So whenever this script file is on an object that gets created, that gets loaded into your game, then start will execute. So let's do that now. So remember how I mentioned uh, the inspector and these components that make up the objects, right? Box collider and a mesh, a mesh renderer and a cube a mesh filter and the transform component all on the cube make the cube what it is because without the mesh renderer, we couldn't see the mesh. Without the box collider, we don't have a hitbox. And these two things have to be on there for these to work. But for instance, without that, we also cannot see the mesh as it defines what the mesh is. So these individual components, these are called components, make up what the object is. And what's important about this is we write script files to attach to objects to make them what they are, we write our own custom components, like Box Collider. Someone wrote that, and then we attached it to this object. We write our own and attach it to the objects. So what I wrote was the character script file, and I'll just drag and drop this onto my cube as a component, and now we have a character script component 
attached to the object. So now, once this cube, once I play the game and this cube is in the game, we should have a print to the console. So to test this, we will click the play button, which will simulate the game right here inside the editor. So if I go to the game view here and I click play, what I see in the bottom left corner is hello there. And that's because this is like a collapsed console. It just shows the latest message in the console right here on the bottom bar. If you want to see everything, you click on console and you can see it in its entirety. You'll have multiple uh, things listed here and you can scroll through them and, you know, toggle things on and off. But this is all we care about for now. We got a command to do something and print something to the console. And that's what's important. Now, character doesn't do anything, right? We just called it character for fun. Uh, but in the next lesson, maybe we'll write some variables that will define what a character kind of is, just for fun, just as we talk about what variables are and that kind of thing. So we can kind of have a cohesive thing going here. That's going to be in the next lesson where we cover variables, guys. My name is Austin, and I will see you there. Hey, guys, welcome back. In this lesson, we're going to look at variables and data types, or data types, and a few of the math operators that we're going to be using throughout this course. So again, variables, they're just a way to store data that you can reference later somewhere else that you reference that name for that variable, right? So if you have a variable called uh, player health and it's equal to 15, well, later on, if you were to call and, and reference player health, that value will be 15. But then if you change that value, say the player takes damage and you subtract five health from the player, well, now they have 10 life. So wherever's referencing that variable for player health, they now get 10 life. So that's how you do that kind of thing. It's a very important thing uh, to understand in order to make any progress when it comes to programming. But as I mentioned, variables are created with a data type. So you've got you know st your strings, integers, and booleans that we talked about. Uh, those are the, the key components there that we're gonna have to understand. But there's also a ton of other value types, or I'm sorry, uh, data types for us to use. We're just not going to touch on many of them at the moment. So variables need to be declared or defined uh, before you can use them. So in this case, we're not using a proper C sharp syntax because I don't have the semicolon here, but imagine there's a semicolon there. Uh, string, my name is equal to Austin. So string is the type of variable this is, right? And it holds a string of text. Uh, my name is the name of the variable. And then that's the declaration for that variable. And then I'm assigning a value to that variable. I'm saying it's equal to Austin. Same goes for this one. This is the declaration of this variable. I'm declaring it, I'm defining it here. And then I'm assigning a value here. This equal sign is called the assignment operator. It's saying this gets assigned this value. This gets assigned this value. So this is an assignment operator. But it's easy to think of it as this equals that. So a few of the important types we're gonna be using, and there, uh, keep in mind, there are many, many types uh, in C Sharp. We're going to look at strings, like we know the string of text, integers, integer value, bool, true or false. But then there's float, which is this, you know, from this value to this value. <laughs> but the thing to keep in mind is float allows us to have a decimal place, right? Uh, down to about seven or eight digits before you start losing accuracy. Uh, and that's just due to what's called a floating point error. So you'll have rounding errors down at that point. So if you have really crucial data, that you need to have, you know, seventh or eighth place be uh, precise and accurate and not be off by one or two. If you need that, then you'll want to use something called a double or a decimal type. They just take up a bit more memory because they have to be more precise and floats don't really care about, you know, the seventh or eighth place and beyond that. They'll just get it kind of close. So it's a bit more efficient to use. So these are the types we're going to be using. So we have, you know, the item name, iron axe, uh, the item levels, 15, uh, the equipables, a bool, B-O-O-L, boolean here. And it's true. So you can equip the iron axe, for instance. The durability of that iron axe is 1.575. Well, we could have went down a few more places here and still had uh, very accurate values for that. But when it comes to durability and, and a lot of things in games... It doesn't matter, even if this value here was off by one, sometimes when I check it, it's not gonna be that big of a deal, as it's just the durability, right? If, if, it, if you have 0 .0001 instead of 0 .0002 or whatever, it's not gonna be that big of a difference in this type of thing. So now let's talk about a couple of mathematical operators that we're gonna be using, and you're gonna know these from just basic everyday life stuff. The plus sign, you know, it's gonna be the add, so add 
uh, 5 to 5, the result of that would be 10, right? Just a simple sum. Uh, subtract, same thing. Just left, uh, you, get, you subtract the right from the left. Uh, multiply, you're going to multiply the right by the left. And then divide, you're going to divide the right by the left. And just basic math rules apply there. And then you have what's called assignment operators with a little mathematical operator with it. So you have the equal sign, which we call the assignment operator. But then next to that, you have the math operator. So these are math assignment operator. Uh, so what this does, and I have an example here, health plus equals five. And this is just shorthand for this right here. Health is equal to whatever health is equal to plus five. So let's say health is 10. This would say health is equal to 10 plus five, but then health is 15. So next time I do this, it'll say health is equal to 15 plus five. And you can see why adding uh, a value to the value of itself and then assigning that value to itself is very important. And this is a quick way to write uh, health is equal to health plus five or health is equal to health minus five. It's just simply health minus equals five. And the same goes for multiplication and division. Damage is equal to damage times five, and damage is equal to damage divided by five, just a shorthand for that. So now let's jump into Visual Studio and write up a few things and just see how this works. So I said that variables have to be declared and defined. So let's do that first. Let's create a variable that's going to be our character name. We'll have a string. It's going to be a string of text, right? We're declaring it's going to be a string, and I want to call it character name. Now, this is declaring this variable string character name is the name. I can add a semicolon there without assigning a value to it. And this will make this variable exist. Now, it will be empty. There's no string of text assigned to it, but it exists. So now what I can do is I can assign a value to it later on. Maybe I want to declare it here and then use it somewhere else to assign a value. So now I can say character name and notice the suggestions are based on my code base, whatever's in my, my scripts, it will look through that and find what's relative to what I'm typing. So character names, what I want. And one thing I want to point out that I've not mentioned yet is uh, this, this casing going on. I have a lowercase C uppercase N. This is called camel casing. And you may even see it like, like if I were to say character script, you would see the first letter is capitalized. Second one is S uh, is capitalized. That's a different type of casing, but you'll also use that. Uh, but this is called camel casing. It's called that because you have the hump, right? It's capital in the middle. You have a hump. If you had something else here, you would capitalize it as well. So you capitalize every word in there so you can read it very easily and see what it is. And that is just uh, standard approach to writing code, most code in general, but especially C sharp. So character name is equal to, and now I can assign a value to it now that I've declared it. And I can say the character name is Austin and then end that statement as well with a semicolon. Now I have a green squiggly here that says, hey, you've defined this uh, and you've given it a value, but you've not used it for anything. So it's just telling me, hey, this is kind of pointless. Uh, you may want to look into it. Maybe you forgot something or maybe it's just it shouldn't be here and you're just wasting this <laughs> these two lines here because it's not doing anything. But this is an example. It doesn't really matter. So it's fine that it's got this green squiggly there. So just to keep track here, this is declaring the variable and this is assigning the variable. OK, we can also do an int like that. We can say uh, character level is equal to five. Notice we assigned the value right after we declared it. This is what we was doing earlier. We can declare a variable like this and then assign it later or we can assign it while we're declaring it. But what's fun about this is we talked about the mathematical operators and they don't have to just apply to, you know, if I have a five here, I can say five times five, you know, that's 25, it's fine. But they don't have to apply directly to what we see as a number because to the computer, it sees character level as a number. It is a number. It is an integer, right? It doesn't care that this looks like that and that looks like that. To it, it is a number. To it, it is a five. So as a result of that, let's create an int called experience. And what I can do is I can say it's equal to character level times five. So I'm taking character level, which is five, multiplying it by five is saying that's how much experience my guy has. I don't know, that may not make any sense in a game, but the idea is we can multiply an integer by an integer, even though it's a variable, assign that value to another variable. Now experience is equal to whatever character level times five is. Even if character level changes, it still multiplies the new value by five. And experience is always equal to whatever character level times five is. So you can see how powerful this can be, right? You can see why this is important to do. 
if you just had uh, numbers spread throughout your script and you have to go through and change stuff, that's not going to be very fun. So variables like this are very important. Same goes for floats, right? If we had a float, uh, and again, we'll just say this is item durability or whatever, is equal to 1.567F. Now, why is that F there? We added that in the image and I didn't talk about it. Well, if I remove the F, let's try that. What happens? It's going to give me a red squiggly. Red squiggly is bad, right? It says literal of type double cannot be implicitly converted to type float. Use an F suffix to create a literal of this type. Now, that's a bunch of gibberish, right? Without the F there, it tries to automatically treat this as a double. Double is the default decimal point number that you'll have. So to say this isn't a double, this is a float. Again, float is less accurate at a deeper decimal place, but it uses less resources as a result of that. So in most cases, it's the best way to go, unless you have to be very precise. So we add an F there and we say, okay, this is a float. But now that's an interesting point though, because it was saying I can't convert it to a float. And since I can't convert it to a float, I cannot assign that value to a float because you can't assign a double value to a float. You can't assign a string value to a float. It has to be a value of the same type. That's the whole point of the type system. You can never pass in accidentally the wrong thing because it'll be like, hey, I'm looking for this specific type and you gave me that type. So it's, it's, it's called a strongly typed language whenever it forces you to use specific types. So what happens then if I do this? Experience, now remember this is equal to whatever this is. Experience is equal to item durability. Now item durability is a float, not an integer. So it's like, hey, Again, uh, you can't convert this directly to an int. It's a float. And, but then it says an explicit conversion exists. Are you missing a cast? So what is a cast? A cast is when you take a type of one type, say in this case, float, and you convert it directly to another type. In this case, an integer. So it, what that would do for us, 1.567, is it would just remove the 0.567 make it a one. Now that may not be ideal for you. You may want to round it up or down, but that's something else entirely. So this could convert it if I were to cast it with two parentheses, two parentheses in front of it, and I'll type in int. And that says, I want to convert this to an integer value and then assign it to experience. But what about this way about it? What if I took item durability and I said it was equal to experience? This is interesting because I don't get an error, right? It says that's fine. The reason that's fine is because item durability doesn't have to guess at anything. It doesn't have to think, does he want to remove some values from this to make this happen? Uh, I should first ask permission before I do that. In this case, that's why we cast the value to the int. So it doesn't just make the decision for us. Because again, we're, re we're losing data when it does that. Uh, whereas this has to lose no data because experience is a one or a five or 10 and a float can be a one, five or 10, but it can also be a 1.7 and a 10.2 and so on. So that's why it can directly convert it for us because it doesn't have to do any guesswork. And you probably guessed it, but you can't do stuff like um, item durability is equal to character name, right? The reason you can't, because this is string, what would it do? This is text. What would this number do with that? Well, it can't do anything with it. It makes sense that it says, hey, I can't do that. But what if you try to do character name is equal to item durability. So this is gonna say, cannot implicitly convert float to string. Now you may be thinking, well, there's a lot of times I probably want to show that float value, let's say it's health, or in this case it is item durability, you may want to show that to the player. You may want to say you have 1.5 item durability in the UI somewhere or whatever in the interface. Uh, there's, a, there's a direct way to convert numbers to floats because you're going to have to do that, right? So you can display it in a text somewhere. And to do that, you'll add a period this is a dot for dot notation. It's a, it's a way to say, go through item durability, go use this value and then do something with it. Now, what you can do with it is do thing called to string. And now to string is a method. So as we know, it requires parentheses, right? That denotes that's a method. 
And what that's going to do is take this value and simply convert it to a string value. So now if it's 1.567F, even though this will get to it first before that happens, but let's just assume this doesn't happen. So now this will be 1.567F as the character name in string format. So you'll be able to see it as text. So now let's do some more math. That, that all makes sense for now, right? The, the casting of values to certain types. Now, it'll take a bit of time to learn what can become something automatically, what requires something like this two-string type of thing, what requires a cast like this. And that's just something you'll learn just by looking it up, you know, Googling. So now for some more math. Let's say that we took experience again, and we're just going to keep playing with this. It's not going to make any sense in the sense of a game, but we'll play around with it. We'll say experience is equal to item durability times 1.5F. And I'll put these in parentheses, right? So we know that this is going to happen before whatever else happens. Order of operations applies. Basic mathematical order of operations. Uh, uh, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. So I'm going to go in that order. But if you add the parentheses, that's going to execute that first, no matter what, which is how you kind of remove it from that order to say this is special, this goes first. And then I can divide it by something, you know, interesting here. Let's try dividing it by a uh, character level. Now, this will give me something interesting here because I'm multiplying item durability, which is a float, by another float, 1.5F, right? But then I'm dividing that float value that this would be by character level which is an integer. And it can do that just fine, but what it's trying to do then is take that result, which would be a float value, 20.5 divided by 10, would not be in a, an integer value, which is what experience is. So we have an issue there. So what I can do is take and cast this result to an integer. So whatever the result of all this calculation here is, it'll come out as an integer. So if it is 20.5, it'll be 20. Experience is now 20, right? If that was the, the correct calculation, but it's not 1.567F times 1.5F uh, divided by character level. I don't know what that is, but it's, you know, it's something that's now an integer. And the other common one we haven't spoke about yet is Boolean, but it's true or false. It's pretty simple. Uh, it'll be bool uh, equivable is equal to false. So uh, this means if I were to check to say, like, is this equipable? Can I equip it on my player? If I look at the variable of equipable and it says false, I know I can't. If it says true, I know I can. And this is what you can use as a condition that we we're talking about before to say, if condition is true, execute this command, right? So the way that would work is I would say if, and we'll do this later on as well. I just want to give you an example. If equipable, so if that evaluates the true, which it won't because it's false, uh, if that's if it's equipable, then I can do something. I can say, I'll just take this, control X, move it down there. So if it's equipable, then my experience is equal to this result. If not, this never happens. So what's interesting there then is I can say, I can take item durability and I can say, if item durability is greater than one F. So if item durability is greater than the greater than value sign here, greater than one float, because this is a float, this is a float, then I do experience. This will evaluate to true or false. This will evaluate to a Boolean. This is a comparison operator. It's gonna compare the left side to the right side. Now again, we'll talk about this later on in more detail, but this is just how it works. And that's pretty much the basics of variables and mathematical operators. Uh, there's gonna be a lot more stuff we're gonna do with them, but we'll talk about it as we go. As I know, it can be kind of boring to just look at all this stuff that has no context to it. It's all just kind of random, you know, item durability, character name, all that stuff. So we'll talk about this stuff later on where if we have a project that we're building in more detail. But in the next lesson, guys, we are going to jump into talking about object-oriented programming which is a mouthful of words that mean some pretty cool stuff. And it's going to be the most complex thing we talked about this far, but I'm pretty excited about it. So I will see you in the next lesson, guys.